So, with that, Eric Jacobson is going to give you an old-fashioned talk, no pictures, just talk. Okay. Uh, Eric Jacobson. Yeah, no, no need for no need for a PowerPoint and you know all sorts of modern technology. I've been doing this like an old-fashioned preacher for years, so why change now? Um, so I, I had gotten an email a number of months ago, and then I was at a meeting uh, a week or so ago, and someone reminded me that I was talking here, and I'd forgotten that I was supposed to be here. So I'm glad I got that reminder because then I had to go back and. Uh, check my email from last fall. So uh, I, I'm the CEO of the Battle of Franklin Trust. We manage uh, Carter House and Carnton in Franklin and since 2021 um, we have managed Ripa Villa which is uh, just outside of Spring Hill. So to give everyone a little bit of background um, perhaps about myself or the organization um, in which I am involved. Also then some backstory about the Fuller story, which I I'm, I'm, guess I'm not surprised that most people probably haven't heard the term, but the Fuller story was an effort that we undertook in Franklin a number of years ago to try and provide some additional context in the town square. Um, because of course the town square had a Confederate monument in the center of it for many, many years. In fact, going all the way back to 1899. So. Um, we worked to add some additional interpretive elements, so I'll get to that in a bit. But a little bit of background uh, about myself. Um, I like to tell people I did not come from any sort of academic background. Uh, my interest was just a love of American history. Now that doesn't mean that I loved everything about American history, but I was certainly um, very much interested in the story of this experiment in democracy. And I have always been very interested in the idea that while we are very unique, our government is certainly unique in the history of the world and remains that way, human beings are human beings. And human beings will do their utmost to try and shortchange or take advantage of other human beings. And I think sometimes the American experiment has shown, if nothing else, the one thing that has protected us, if, if even at times has impeded our uh, progress, is the construct of our government. The founders were quite aware of the short failings of people. So they wanted a government of the people, but they wanted to protect some people from the others. <laughs> because we can descend into our own little tribal kind of mobs. And this government has endured. It endured through slavery, it endured through civil war, it endured as we fought world wars and cold wars, and here we are today. A country mostly at peace, economic prosperity largely has been the theme of at least the 20th century and the 21st century, but we still, you know, we still occasionally confront the ghosts of our past. They come lurking back around um, it seems with a reg regular pace, they seem to emerge again and again to haunt us. I grew up around a lot of guys who had fought in World War II and in Korea. And so my interest in history was driven by those who had sacrificed, well, very much. Some had sacrificed personally, some had watched friends die, they had certainly sacrificed months or years of their lives. I adored the founding of this country, still do. That in a world that was dark and dangerous, there was this flickering light that started in the 1770s. And today, I think that people in my field are often fighting a two-front war. We are fighting against orthodox leftists who want to rip apart um, just about everything there is in the country and describe it to everything from racism to sexism to orthodox 
people on the right side of the spectrum who are convinced that the other side is evil and that all history is somehow exactly the same and must be treated the same and I reject both outright, which makes me a heretic in a lot of different camps. <laughs> you know, if you can upset Democrats and Republicans, you've probably done something right. <laughs> and so I always saw history as something that was very, very intricately woven together. Race, religion, age, culture, education, one thing bound us together, but a lot of things gave us distinct differences. It's something Abraham Lincoln talked about as he argued that the Declaration of Independence meant exactly what it said. It didn't say just white people. It said all people, all men, which is figure of speech, as I often have to remind some of my leftist friends when Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon and he said that's one small step um, for man, one giant leap for mankind, he wasn't talking just about the boys. So when Jefferson said all men are created equal, he didn't just mean men and he certainly didn't just mean white men. He meant all people gifted something by a creator. Down here on earth, where there's common law, we'll rip each other's eyes out if given the chance. But a creator made us equal. And this is what Lincoln was echoing. Except Lincoln was living in a very different time than the founding in the era of enlightenment and certainly much different in the world in which we live. You may be wondering, what the heck does this have to do with something I've never heard of called the Fuller Story? Everything. Because one of the things that I hear today, and I have to tell you, anybody who knows me knows I don't have much of a filter. It drives me mad when I hear people my age or older talk about how young people either don't know anything about history or don't care about history. Believe me, I know lots of people who are 50 plus who don't know anything about history. I see them every day of the week. <laughs> Yes, young people are beset with the same problems all of us did when we were young. Well, you know what? When you're 17, you're just figuring out how to think straight, let alone understand the Kansas-Nebraska Act or the complexities of the Constitution or when the Republican Party was founded or when there was a Battle of Franklin or Battle of Nashville. I didn't learn about any of that until I was much older. But then I was an oddball, you know. I was talking to combat vets, asking them what they thought about this and that. I was pushing my teachers, what about this, what about this? You know, I was, that, I was that kid. Like when they took us to visit the mummy exhibit, I actually paid attention. It wasn't just a day out of school. I was interested in how they wrapped a human being in these things, and then they could cut half of it off so you could see the face. Like 3,000 years ago seemed like a long time. And I listened to people, young and old, because I wanted to know what they thought. Because one of the heartbeats, if not the heartbeat, of this experiment is <coughs> us. And you can go around the room and I could ask you what you think of the Tennessee Titans and you probably get 40 different answers. Mm -hmm. So why would we think the same about race? Or secession? Or regionality? or the Constitution, or whatever. We argue about everything all the time. So I became interested in the American Civil War. And I really didn't care about the Eastern Theater. Oh, I had a cousin who talked all the time about Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson and the Battle of Gettysburg, and I was like, ugh, I've had enough of that. Plus, every book I opened up had something about Lee or Gettysburg in it. <coughs> I was interested in the Western Theater. I was interested in places that no one hardly talked about. Shiloh, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, Franklin, Nashville, Fort Donaldson, Clarksville, Iuka. I was interested in the Trans-Mississippi. I was interested in Arkansas and Missouri. I was interested in the war outside of Robert E. Lee's little domain. <coughs> I was interested about where Grant came from, because Grant, where did he come from? The West. Started out here, then he had to go east. Led me to Franklin. And actually, it led me, because I had no ancestors who fought in the war. I was one of these, you know, immigrant hordes that came over traveling across the ocean, you know, when there weren't a lot of rules. No different than people who come across the desert today or swim across the ocean. 
want something different, something hopefully better than the god-awful place that they'd come from. So my people were Scandinavians, Swedes and Germans, ate terrible food, talked with a funny accent, couldn't stand kings and queens and came here. And I remember as a young person, I thought, you know, if the Civil War had ended out differently, my family would have never had a country to come to. The United States would have died. Certainly would have been split in two with slavery and a good bit of it. But if you could prove that secession was a viable option, why stop, why stop it splitting in half? Why not break it up again? How, how long do you think it would have taken Texas to figure out if it could leave one country, it could leave another? <laughs> Pretty soon Minnesota leaves the Union. Pretty soon California is like, you know, we like this whole West Coast thing. We want it to be our own. Pretty soon Mormons have got their own state. Pretty soon Mexico's invading, pretty soon Britain's invading, Japan, China, Russia, it's just a non-stop collapse. And so I ended up in Franklin. Ended up at Spring Hill, ended up at Franklin, ended up at Nashville. And for years, well about 20 years now, all we've done is talk about what happened in 1864 and how what spilled out really, in, even here, helped bring an end to our terrible war, our great national tragedy in which our disagreements led to us killing ourselves to the tune of 750,000. A number of today that would exceed 7 million if you looked at it based on population. And yes, I watched movies like Gone with the Wind and I sat through the mental anguish of North and South and watching Patrick Swayze portray a Confederate soldier and then I watch terrible movies like Gods and Generals and oh, thought, is this really what the Civil War is? Is it round table meetings and we're all just Americans and brother versus brother or was there more to it? And I think what I began to understand when I hung around these old boys who'd fought in France, Germany, godforsaken little islands in the South Pacific, killed human beings and saw them killed in droves. I couldn't talk to the Civil War veterans, but I saw in the eyes of some of those old men that there was nothing romantic about war. It certainly wasn't a nice painting you put on the wall, and it wasn't a cute movie. It was unbridled violence. And it was about slavery. We should shed ourselves, our own mental shackles, and just admit that mostly white people killed each other for four years because we couldn't resolve the issue of African slavery. We couldn't get rid of it when we founded the country. We couldn't get rid of it when we created our constitution. We tried to legislate it through the Missouri Compromise. We stood down secession during the nullification crisis. We fought with it in the halls of Congress through the 1830s and the 1840s. We grabbed land from Mexico after that war and made Texas a slave state and California a free state. We tried to legislate it some more in the Compromise of 1850. We tried to legislate it some more in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. A political party emerged as an anti-slavery party to combat those who supported slavery and then the Supreme Court ruled that black people had no rights whatsoever in Dred Scott and then we elected presidents or voted against them based on the issue of slavery and then John Brown tried to lead a rebellion because of slavery and they hanged him and Abraham Lincoln was elected at the head of an anti-slavery party and those states began to secede because they couldn't fathom having a Republican in the White House at the head of an anti-slavery party because there were people in this country who were horrified at the thought of abolitionists and Negroes in charge of anything. Let it go. If you know anyone who wants to argue about states' rights, tell them they're right. It was about the states' right to own slaves. It's not any of our fault that slavery didn't exist in Michigan and never did. It's not any of our faults that slavery did exist in New York and they had abolished it. It is also not our fault that people in Mississippi had slavery, always did, and fought and died to protect it. 
On January 1st, 1863, the President of the United States issued arguably what is the most important, if not famous, executive order of all time, the Emancipation Proclamation. You know what he did right there? He proved to every white Southerner who had opposed him he was the greatest threat to slavery that had ever risen to power. Because people today will try and tell you, well, he didn't care about slavery. Well, sure, he sure did just about everything he could to attack it from every angle. He gave a speech in Peoria in 1854. He railed against the Dred Scott decision. He argued with Stephen Douglas about whether the Declaration of Independence meant just white people or maybe it just meant everyone. He was elected the head of that party and then halfway through the war, he told his cabinet, you know, we might win the war and there'll still be slavery and we'll end up right back in the same doggone place that we were when this thing started and where we have been since the beginning. This cannot happen. We have to strike at slavery and use the military, the war machine, to destroy it once and for all. Because we can't legislate it and we can't change people's hearts. And there has to be a union. Secession can't just be willy-nilly. You get to do whatever you want, whatever the excuse. We have to end slavery. A provision of the proclamation allowed the United States Army and the United States Navy to do the unthinkable. I assure you, I was raised in Minnesota, lots of racial prejudices up north too. But the idea of arming black men, giving them a rifle, sent shivers through the white southern population. It was their worst nightmare come true, and northerners were extraordinarily skeptical. But the terms of the war changed, and within two years, the rebellion stood on the cusp of being destroyed, and 180,000 black men had joined. They were not even citizens of the United States, and legally, until the ratification of the 13th Amendment, they were not even free, many, and yet they fought. And somewhere back in my, the back of my often uh, muddied mind filled with needless facts, I thought, my goodness, is there anything more noble than to fight for something beyond yourself? Because certainly, yes, they were fighting to free themselves, but they were fighting for something bigger, the United States, to save it, to preserve it, to rid ourselves of slavery. They weren't fighting for something they owned. They weren't fighting for a piece of ground. Maybe they were fighting for family or maybe they had a home somewhere. But what a noble endeavor. It's what these men who I saw who'd come home from World War II had done. Fighting for something, you couldn't even really touch it, right? Unless you want to touch the ground fighting for something bigger. Part of the problem with our war is we'd like to think that it was just a minor disagreement. You know, brother versus brother, right? Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. As I've been wont to say, there was a reason uh, the Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln ended up at the head of their respective countries, or country and attempt at creating a country. And it's not like Jefferson Davis couldn't say the words that Abraham Lincoln said, but he couldn't say the words that Abraham Lincoln said. Those words weren't in here. It's not what he believed. The two sides of our Civil War fought for completely different purposes. And sometimes we're just going to have to swallow that bitter pill. They weren't fighting for the same thing. Not anything remotely close to it. But we've done a really good job of making the Confederacy super sexy. 
You know, it's Bo and Luke Duke, right? And the General Lee. It's Hank Williams singing, singing if heaven ain't a lot like Dixie. It's Ole Miss football games. Those are things that are pretty white, too. And if you're not white, or <laughs> if you're not from around here, <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> been called a Yankee, been called a liberal, a socialist, a Marxist, a threat, been threatened, had that flag shoved in your face enough, yeah, you start to push back. I've heard it all. I understand as best I can why people who lived in this part of the country or in Georgia did what they did as well as I can understand what someone from New Hampshire to Minnesota thought. I understand that they were people of their time. But that doesn't mean that we treat them all the same because they didn't agree. You have to sort of individually analyze what's going on. Years ago, I think at least one person in this room has heard me tell this story, I sat in a meeting having a long conversation, probably the 50th such one I'd had, we were gonna have another reenactment. I never liked reenactments, I must tell you. Do you know why? I never thought making kabuki theater out of combat made any sense. People die in combat. They die horribly in some cases. Painfully, lingering, screaming and hollering for their mothers. And we applaud the boys as they charge across the field. So we're having another meeting about another reenactment and I suggested that because I was aware that there was a, an original courthouse in the Williamson County Square, and adjacent to the courthouse was Market House. These were standard things. You know, it's like seeing Walgreens and Starbucks. You just see it, and there it is, right? Well, in every county seat of every state, not just among the 11 that seceded, but you could probably make it about 15 total states when you add in Kentucky and Missouri and Maryland and Delaware, in every county seat, there was a courthouse. That's why they call it the county seat, right? That's where all the legal goodies get played out. And in Franklin, there was a market house. And in the market house, you could buy everything, anything, including people. And it went on, as a matter of fact, in a way of life all the time. And so we were sitting in this meeting and I said, I don't think we need to have another reenactment. You know what we should do? We should reenact a slave auction. And we should sell women and children for about four hours. Of course, everyone in the room sort of looked like some of you right now. <laughs> Probably thinking, my God, man, you've lost your mind. And I wasn't really serious, but I thought if we're gonna be, if we're gonna reenact something, why not do that? Oh, but we wouldn't wanna do that. That'd make us feel bad, right? I had been in this field for 10 years. My background was, I came out of the corporate world. So I was one of those people, you know, created a business and made some money. And then I decided that wasn't any fun anymore. So I moved to Tennessee. I lived in Arizona for a long time and came here and wrote a book about what? Civil War combat, Spring Hill and Franklin. That was my thing. And I could talk to you till you all fell asleep about that. And I'd been talking about that for years because we were saving of the battlefield what we could in Franklin and we were telling the story about why you had to come there to really see how the war ended, how that spills into Nashville, so forth and so on. And then one day, a young man who happened to be white walked into a church in South Carolina and he sat down, had a Bible study, spent about an hour with these fine folks and then he walked around in the room that night in the church and shot and killed nine of them because they were black. And within days, we started to see the photographs of him troping around at Confederate cemeteries and antebellum plantation sites in the South Carolina area. And in many of them, he had on a shirt with the Confederate flag on it, waving the Confederate flag. Same flag that the 
segregationists used in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, they shoved in the face of people just trying to be equal, wanting to vote. Same flag. Same flag that had been used in the 1860s, and there he was. And that day changed everything, because the people who visited Carter House and Carton, one of the great things about working at a historic site is you really get to see who the people are. And they're wonderful because they'll tell you and teach you so much. You could never learn enough than what you could get from the people. That's why politicians should get out of their office and spend some time with the people. They might learn something. The questions were profound. People started asking about the Confederacy. They asked about race. They asked why. They asked, how is this still happening? Why is this happening? Of course, there were some of the excuse makers too, but mostly it was how and why. What do we do? Well, we all know what happened over the course of the next couple of years with another presidential election. And then in 2017, there was an episode in Charlottesville, Virginia, which at its heart was a confrontation over what? Confederate monuments, Confederate iconography. And Charlottesville really struck me because I, I don't have, I think hero gets often overplayed. I mean, I, you know, there are people that I greatly respect and I have people I think who, you know, reshape the world. But Thomas Jefferson is one of those people for me that I think is just his, his influence is, well, it's self-evident. <laughs> Charlottesville is Jefferson's town. He lived up on the mountain. He helped build the University of Virginia. Yes, he had his shortcomings, I get it. But that's his town. And they put up a statue of Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson in that town, and neither one of them had a doggone thing to do with anything that ever happened in Charlottesville, ever. Except it happens to be in Virginia. And I, you know, as someone who I was curious and I wouldn't ever shut up and I was always asking questions and I traveled around a lot, and I, I see these monuments everywhere and I saw these monuments in places where these guys never were. Robert E. Lee in New Orleans. I was like, what does he have to do with New Orleans history? Nothing. But there he was. And there he was in Charlottesville. Next thing you know, Charlottesville explodes. So there was a rumor mill, you know, who that can start churning hot. There was gonna be a rally in the square in Franklin. We heard everything from it was gonna be Antifa to the Ku Klux Klan. And I thought, well, I gotta go see this. Cause you know, you never know what might happen. You gotta go to a Metallica concert once because you just have to see it sometimes. <laughs> so I went to the square. It wasn't a rally. It was a prayer vigil. And, you know, altogether, un, you know, not terribly exciting. And so I turned around and went home. It was at the end of the day, at 5.30, 6 o'clock or something like that. And um, the next day in the newspaper, I read one of the pastors who had attended the vigil had said, maybe it's time that we should take down the Confederate monument. And I went, whoa, now hold on a second. Because, see, here's where you get into some trouble and you don't even know what you're stepping into because the monument in Franklin, well, yes, it's a Confederate monument, not all the monuments are the same. This was not a monument that was to an individual. He certainly wasn't, isn't to one of the leaders, and God help us, he's not at least one to Nathan Bedford Forrest. So, you know, there was some positives, and ultimately it was a memorial, it was a monument that was put up on the anniversary of the battle, 35 years after the battle. And in many ways, it struck me as somewhat like the Vietnam War Memorial in the sense that it was there to represent those who had died without any real you know, reflection on the war itself. There is some language etched into the base of it that I think is a little lost cause-y, but you know, all in all, this was not Robert E. Lee. And please don't misunderstand. I'm not, I don't think Robert E. Lee would have wanted his monument all over. So this isn't a statement about him as much as it is about stone that's erected everywhere mostly by people who never knew him. Well, anyways, I thought, well, now, hold on. Even if you could get the monument, so I reached out to him, and he, he got in touch with me. 
And I said, even if you could get it taken down, what are you going to do? You, so this is the problem that happened like in New Orleans. They took down statues and then de never did anything else. So why do one thing if you're not going to do another? Because otherwise you just have a big empty spot. Or you end up with some ridiculous abstract art that makes no sense. I think that actually happened in a city I won't name, but it's like a Portland of the South. Um, so we started talking. This pastor happened to be white. Put me in touch with two black pastors. One who had lived through segregation, the 60s. Grew up in it. Grew up in the heart of it. Native to Tennessee. The other guy's about my age. He's from Maryland, but lived in this area for 25 or so years. And we just started talking about what we should do. And one of the points the pastors made was, you know, people always come to us when something's happened. Somebody died. Somebody sinned. Something's wrong. We're always reacting. What if we did something that was proactive? Try to do something different. And we made it clear that we weren't wanting to address the Confederate monument at all. We didn't want to take it down, and we're not going to, we're not even really going to, we're just going to pretend like it's not there. Even though you know it is, you're just like, okay, it's there. We want to do something else. So we went to the city leaders. If you know anything about Franklin, it's pretty conservative. There was some arm twisting that went on. But we got city to understand that this was, this was okay, this was good. This was telling a fuller story, which one of the pastors coined. It's not the full story, you can't, you can't do that in one spot. You can't do that with a full book. But you could tell a fuller story. Because there were some things that happened right there in the square, which is the public's gathering place. The Confederacy lived for four years. And we still, in some ways, live in its shadow. Its legacy, which is like DNA, wound into race, white and black and regionality, and it's, it's, it's just woven into the American experiment. You know, the Confederate effort existed, took place within our country. So it's very much part of who we are. But it, 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 it lingers far longer than it ever lived. And we started to hear from some of the people. Why do you want to ruin the square? Why do you want to do this? Oh, this is just a Trojan horse. You're intending to take down the monument. One guy said, well, the blacks have February. Why do they have to have the square? And I thought, that's one of those moments when you realize either you know exactly what you're saying or you don't have any idea and you should pay attention. One of the greatest that I heard really over and over again, not really from city leaders, I will say these people really represented the city well. They listened. And they had concerns, but they listened. I think a lot of that was leadership. The mayor and the city administrator were unheralded heroes in this and sort of herding politicians, which isn't always easy, to guide them toward a good solution for the city. But one of the things that I heard all the time was, well, what does black history have to do with Franklin? <laughs> this is a county in which half the people that lived there in 1860 were slaves. And the people would ask that question. So we started with interpretive markers. And we really thought this should be a two-phased approach. We would start with interpretive markers, and then we had a secondary idea about another statue. So the interpretive markers are pretty straightforward. The slave market, or let me rephrase, it was never called a slave market. It was called the market house. Enslaved men, women, and children were bought and sold there. So that was, for me, I thought we gotta have that one. Because that's, do you, know, do you know, does anyone know, happen to know where that building was located in the square? Okay, so where the Confederate monument sits today is right where it was. So you're going to talk about erasing history. 
Because when they tore the first courthouse down and built the one that you see today, the historic courthouse in the square, well, the original one stood right in the middle of the square. And the market house was attached to it. And I thought, well, how ironic. They put a Confederate monument right over black history. So we can't take it down, but we can put up a marker, which tells you then a lot as you think about the monument in front of you. And you read about what happened to people for 50 years right there. So I thought that, yeah, obvious. Battle of Franklin. City actually really thought we should have a Battle of Franklin marker in the square to tell the average visitor, hey, something important happened in this town. You might want to visit Carter House or Carrington or the battlefield. There was also one for the Franklin, what was termed the Franklin Race Riot, which was a confrontation between white and black, largely, but Ku Klux Klan members and you know, others in 1867. We put up a marker to Reconstruction to talk about some of the positive stories of upward black mobility, like Samson Keeble, who was the first black member of the Tennessee General Assembly, who I think every school child in this state should learn about. Yep, Davy Crockett's really cool, and so is Samson Keeble. Because boy, you had to have a pretty solid backbone to walk into the Tennessee General Assembly <laughs> right after the Civil War when Samson Keeble did it. And he did it. And so we got the markers. We got the markers. Then we proposed the second part, which was a statue. And this was a story, comments, questions I began to hear. Why this statue? We thought it was important to commemorate some of the black men from this area who joined the U.S. Army. A wonderful researcher in Franklin named Tina Jones who has dedicated years of her life to just finding these men. And I, I knew who Tina was and I was aware of her research. Because when the proclamation was released, you know, talk about viral news. No internet and not even the written word, because of course 99.9% .9 of the enslaved community couldn't read or write. Guess what happened? The word spread everywhere. You couldn't stop it. And the enslaved community were their own conduit for how the word was passed. And they knew that the proclamation had been released. They knew that this was a step toward freedom. And they knew that the U.S. Army meant better than what they had in most cases, and that they could become soldiers. There are at least 300 men from Williamson County who joined the U.S. Army and U.S. Navy. Some of them, several, fought at the Battle of Nashville, not far from here, right on Overton Hill, Peach Orchard Hill, falling in waves, fighting for the Union, fighting for the United States. And I heard probably five hundred times. Why would we want to put this statue up in Franklin? They didn't fight here. And at some point, usually when I've had either too much coffee or not enough, I finally said, stop asking that question. Because there are Confederate monuments all over this country where they never fought. There are Confederate monuments in communities all over this country and all they were ever meant to do was just to remember some of the men from that community who served in the Confederate Army. Why can't we do that for black men? Is it because they're black? Or maybe your priorities are just out of whack. And sometimes you have to actually jar people to think. And what I found is when I would do that, <laughs> People would go, oh, I never thought about it that way. And I was like, good, good. I want you to think that way. I want you to think about our history in a different way. We raised $150,000 for a bronze statue. And by the way, if you've ever seen it, some people wonder why he looks the way he does. Well, parts of him, particularly his hands, were overemphasized, his feet. He's standing, one of his feet, up on a stump. The tree of slavery cut down. Rifle at the ready. But one of the things that was important to the black pastors who were behind this, and one of them, Chris Williamson, who leads a church in Brentwood, and this is 
almost an exact quote, Chris said, I want that brother to look like an African. <laughs> he said, I want him to look like my people. And when I first saw him unveiled, it, it was remarkable. And when we unveiled that statue, two years after we, because we got derailed by 2020, markers went in in 2019. So Charlottesville happens in 2017, worked with the city for two years, unveiled the markers in 19, and then unveiled the statue in 2021. And the crowd that saw the statue unveiled was probably three times the size of the one that saw the markers unveiled. And the crowd was as diverse as this country has become in the last, especially the last 50 years. Not just white and black, not just young, old, middle-aged, young, white, brown, black. No protests. Nobody hurling insults. Nobody asking silly questions because there was the embodiment of a U.S. soldier. That's all it was ever intended to be. And he doesn't quite look at the Confederate monument or vice versa. They kind of look at cross directions. But I remember saying to the mayor after it was all over, well, the earth didn't split wide open, did it? <laughs> didn't open up and consume us all. We were able to do this. I don't know if other communities can or will. There have been many communities that have taken in the last, you know, three or four or five years, the initiative to tell the stories of USCTs, United States Colored Troops, because of course these units were all segregated until World War II. So there have been efforts. I think Franklin, though, is unique. You know, it, it's a it's a town where there was a battle that was fought. The Confederate monument there is somewhat unique. As I said, it's not to one of the political or um, military leaders, and also a very rich Black history. Um, that one can tie not just to the past, but to the present. So it might only happen in Franklin. I don't know. There, there might not be people quite crazy enough like us to actually do it. Because I know this in hindsight, and I, I, I guess I know it because I had a few people say this. Most people would never have taken the effort that we did. I know for me, probably one of the telling signs that we were on to something was I had a state legislator contact me one day, wanted to meet with me. This was in probably early 2018. We'd been, had our first public meeting, so we were about six months into this. And he asked to meet with me. And he told me that I needed to stop talking about Charlottesville. And I needed to stop talking about this, because I was upsetting people. The minute you tell me that, you're just gonna make me want to do it 10 times more. <laughs> I should send a con campaign contribution next time he runs. But that was one of those moments, too, and I remember thinking, my goodness, it's the 21st century. What are you afraid of? And I guess I have to also admit, and I'll finish with this and I can take a few questions. I think some of this is just fear. I know some of it is bona fide, legitimate fear from people who are afraid that their history will be erased. You can't really erase history. You can remove something. But you could take down every statue to George Washington in the country, and George Washington's story is quite well known. And frankly, you don't learn a lot standing next to a monument. I mean, I love baseball. I've seen all the stuff from Cooperstown to individual parks. You don't know anything about Kirby Puckett unless you actually saw him play baseball. His statue's cool, but it's not the same as learning about who he was. And that's, that's true, I think, of anybody. I've been to the... Lincoln Memorial, it's, an, it's a wonderful, it's an incredible place. I've been to the Civil Rights Museum, I've been to the Museum of the Confederacy. I think you learn more at those locations than you do at just a statue or a memorial, but it can plant a seed, and I think that we overcame some of the people's fear because we didn't take anything down when we put something up, and every now and then I go down into the square just to see the people. 
and watch them milling around. Because, you know, what do we do every day? We're like little worker bees and ants. We move around. You know, we buy stuff. We see people. We go here. We do that. And we're just sort of zooming around town all day long. And then there's a few tourists sprinkled in. And we're just bzz, bzz, bzz all over the place. And I watch in the square as people go, you know, from, the, uh, from City Hall to Mellow Mushroom. And then they go to the bank. And then they go up here. And then they go over there. And then they're walking along and they see the monument. And they're like, what's this? And then they can read the marker. And they learn something. You know, they do. They learn something. And they learn a little bit about who we were, which I think really helps us understand who we are. And who we are is a country that in just three short years will be celebrating, and I think that's the key word, the 250th anniversary of the founding of this great country. We don't need to make it great again. It's still pretty great. It's got a lot of problems and always has. And for some people, it hasn't been as great as it has been for others. But we keep working at it. We have to keep trying, at least. But in just a few years, it'll be 250 years. You know, that's a long while. That's a long while. Nobody else in a world that copies everything. Nobody's copied our form of government. Why? I don't know. I think they don't want to drive themselves mad. <laughs> or perhaps they don't want to just plant that idea of just baseline equality and liberty and give segmented power to the people. But we've been a force of good. But the last thing that I will remind everyone is we are confronting the legacy of the Confederacy through this effort. Someone asked me, I give a lost cause tour now and again at historic sites. That can be an interesting tour. Because we're confronting the sort of rewriting of why the war was fought 30 or 40 years later. You know, it wasn't really about slavery. Lincoln was a tyrant. The Yankees were bad and all that. And I was giving one of these tours recently, and one of the women who I don't think was buying into much of what I was saying, although she was polite, she said, well, what would you have done differently? And I said, you know what I mean? Presuming the war ended the way that it did. So everything's the same from the early 1600s to 1865. She said, yes. I said, are you sure you want me to give you my opinion? <laughs> She said yes, so I jumped in. And I said, I think we should have left US troops in the South for about 50 or 60 years. <laughs> she said, how, how could you say that? And I said, well, that's what we did to Japan and Germany. We actually treated them like they lost the war. We tried for 10 years, and then we quit. And you know who's really culpable for that? Mostly the white North. The white North that held power just gave up and let the South be its own thing for a long time. And then white and black in the South struggled mightily for generations until you know the first major exodus out of the South in the early 20th century, as many black people left and went North and went West. She didn't like that answer, but I think she understood it. I said the Marshall Plan made sure that people in Germany didn't repeat the mistakes of the past. Same in Japan. And she said, well, what about monuments? And I said, well, you know, monuments are problematic, but they're not all the same. But I will tell you this, only in the United States did we allow the side that lost the war to put up monuments to themselves and then tell everybody they were right. <laughs> find a statue of King George III. If you can find one, I'll give you $20. <laughs> Some people don't like that. They'll glare at me and they'll sneer. Call me a Marxist. Okay. All right, I can wear that. The legacy of the Confederacy is what we struggle with. The right side won the war, folks. Because if the other side had won the war, the country we live in wouldn't exist. The world we live in would not exist. We left Europe because we didn't want to be like them. Had we broken apart in 1861 to 65, we would have become more of an incestuous kind of rat's nest than Europe had ever been. We would have been like the balkanized America constantly ripping and tearing at one another. We could never have been able to say, here we are almost 250 years later. It was a monumental struggle. 
The last bit of information I will tell you is our greatest demographic shift when I see the people, it's young people. So I mentioned earlier about how it drives me mad, how sometimes older people say young people don't care about history. They do. They're visiting in higher numbers than ever before. When I say younger, I'm talking like 40 and under. They're coming out in droves. They want to know. And they don't want the Confederacy made into anything terrible or evil. They just want to know what happened. They just want to know the truth. And they want to know why we still struggle with this today. And that's all part of a great opportunity for us to just admit what happened and what happened afterwards and to work to, you know, just be a little more honest, I think, and tell a fuller story. So we should have trademarked that line. Somebody would probably steal it someday. <laughs> so if you haven't been to Franklin, if you haven't seen this, you should come and see it. The statue is pretty amazing. But even work done here in Nashville, just to commemorate. I mean, look where we are, for goodness sakes. Places like Negley were like beacons of hope for the people who were taking their freedom into their own hands. They flock to places like this. They flock to Franklin. They flock through Triune. They went to Murfreesboro. They wanted to be free, and all of us would too. As Lincoln once said, if being a slave is such a benefit, everyone should try it out for a spell. <laughs> and then he died too. 750,000 plus the president. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Well, I will tell you the one thing I didn't mention in the talk was I didn't talk about how the United Daughters of the Confederacy threatened to sue the city of Franklin. <laughs> that was a fun moment. And the city of Franklin threatened to counter sue them. And there was eventually a legal settlement reached about who owned what. The UDC, I will say this, I think the UDC, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, for anyone who's wondering, did wonderful work in many areas. The UDC memorialized the burial places of Southern men, uh, from privates to general officers. You can go to Rose Hill Cemetery in Columbia, for example, and see General John Carter, who was killed, mortally wounded at Franklin. And he didn't have a grave for decades, or didn't have a grave marker for decades. They put it up. I think those are wonderful. Um, examples of a group of women who got together to remember their men. But they were also very instrumental in the Confederate monuments, both individual monuments and the sort of common Johnny Reb soldier monuments. I think the UDCs, though, their greatest legacy is they got into textbooks. And they got into textbooks in the early 20th century and they really impacted the better part of five or six generations of white Southern kids. You know, because those textbooks weren't being used in the segregated black school, so you were actually creating a greater gulf. White kids were being taught something that was, fr frankly, demonstrably false, and black kids weren't learning anything like that. So, you know, there was just an incessant resist or, a, you know, fight over what was true. And that's something I can tell you we still deal with today. The UDC was, it's one of the most effective campaigns, marketing campaigns in the history of the country. It really is remarkable. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm a Tennessean always. I have thanked God many times that the North won the war. <laughs> I cannot imagine what it would have been, but I think there would have been another war. I think you're right. I said earlier, I think if secession could be proven as a viable alternative, and secession being you can just leave. Nobody can stop you. Want to get married? One of you can just leave. You don't have to go through a divorce. You know, you enter into a legal contract over a piece of land, ah, one of you can just leave. It would have been endless. And that, I think, would have been the endless conflict. And if you look at our, think about a map. Probably 40% of what we know as the United States didn't exist then. We would have been killing each other over copper, silver, gold, the Rocky Mountains, Yellowstone Park. You know, I mean, where would it stop? And 
I told someone the other day, the easiest thing Abraham Lincoln could have done was to let seven states walk away. And then the country would have been broken apart and slavery would have ex existed in both for God knows how long. He made the hardest decision I think perhaps anyone could have made at that moment, which was to, which was essentially to inaugurate a war, to save the Union by force. Yes, sir. Last time I went to Rick Pavel a few months ago, I noticed how while the furniture was gone and the lady there told me they were like they got a few pieces in, I was kind of wondering what the long-term plan was to just refurbish it or talk to the family and get pieces back. So when we inherited, not inherited, when we began managing Rick Pavel, the prior nonprofit had cleaned the place out. So we, we inherited an empty house, and we knew that. Um, after you get over your initial phase of annoyance, um, it was a bit of a blessing because the house needed a lot of restoration. So we have spent the better part of 18 months restoring, um, and that is everything from uh, painting to uh, water mitigation, um, lots of not terribly fun things, but things that must be done. And we've now moved about 35 pieces of furniture in. I very much doubt that we will ever get anything back that once was there, which is a real tragedy. Um, legally, they had the right to do it. They, they own those pieces, but I'm not a lawyer, but I'll tell you this. There's a difference between legalities and ethics. And they stomped all over any ethical um, component of managing a historic site, but I can't change that. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, comment. Uh, your talk was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, one item that uh, you mentioned was the percentage of slaves in uh, Williamson County, which actually exceeded the population of whites Correct. before the Civil War, and that's kind of amazing. And in the map of 18, I think it's the 1883 map of Williamson County, it shows the population, and at that time, blacks and whites, it's almost an equal population then, which showed that there were a whole lot of slaves, and that percentage has changed dramatically. But one thing I want to compliment you on so much is, I have heard your speech many times, and it reminds me of the late Robert Hicks, who was a really close friend of mine, and he gave a similar talk about how it was necessary for the Civil War to happen for our country to become the great country it is. I think we were destined to fight this war. Once we got beyond about 1820 and slavery was growing and there was money and control and race becomes a far greater factor in that than it had been earlier. I mean, race, it was always about race, but race becomes a wedge issue. And from that moment on, the country is headed toward inevitable conflict. I know a lot of people would think we could have somehow avoided it. I, I've yet to see any way, short of the president not being elected or letting those states walk away. Yes, sir. Back. Uh, what will be your take or experience, like a student of the history, uh, you look one way, and for sure, politicians that you work with look the history to different glasses. Uh, your experience, short, is kind of wide open, but it's complicated. I came from different environment, but everything what you taught happened in the different part of the world, mm -hmm. and battle between history, historian, and you know, politicians who a lot of time take their own take using history for political reason. You know, I'm just trying to think of how to answer. You know, I think that politicians are often like lawyers. If all they ever do is hang out with one another, it usually they get detached from the people they're supposed to represent. Um, and I think sometimes it's good for politicians, I will say, sometimes the people can be downright rude. I mean, I can tell you the emails we got. So politicians, you know, as public figures, they, they must just get berated on a regular basis. And I, I think if you don't have thin skin, that can wear you out. But I, I will tell you in my work in Franklin, most people who serve 
really have their heart in the right place, even if you might disagree with them politically, because I've always encouraged everyone, you don't like politician, why don't you run? Give of yourself and see if you want that job. Um, but there are politicians who are demagogues masked as politicians. And I find them to be very dangerous, but that's, they're still the people too. And so the way to um, remove that threat, if you will, is to make sure they don't get reelected. I listened to a politician just recently say that an element of black history that is being discussed in Franklin and being added to the interpretive landscape is a false narrative. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting statement. To be, that's basically saying that what's being proposed is a lie. You just don't like it. So I've never been a politician, but I've learned to work in those shark infested waters and it can be kind of fun. <laughs> yes, sir. Love your passion on the topic. It was, it was a, great, uh, a great speech. Um, I guess my thought, I always loved uh, historical fiction, uh, Killer Angels, the Hicks book. Yeah. Um, how accurate can you say those, those you know, those works of fiction are. I mean, if you're just referencing those two, I mean, Killer Angels is, that, that's the book that actually spawns the movie Gettysburg, which for the most part is pretty good. Um, historical fiction certainly has um, a wide audience. And I think that just like any other book, there, there are ones that are pretty good and then there are ones that are not. Yeah. Um, Howard Barr wrote a trilogy um, about really focused on Franklin. I think Barr's books are great. Robert's book, his first book, Widow of the South, which yeah. you know, brought droves of people to Carnton. Uh, what I tell people when they ask me is the core of the story is essentially accurate. You know, the dialogue isn't and some of the characters are fictional, but the thrust of what the McGavicks went through and their care of the cemetery is the line. It does sometimes, you know, because if you've ever seen Robert's book, it clearly says on the cover, a novel. And then people will come and think that it's all true and then they get upset when they find out it's not. And I'm like, well, gosh, I'm sorry. I don't know. Do you go to Star Wars and think that's real? <laughs> you know, I mean, it says it's a novel right on the front. But having known Robert for years, I mean, his goal, I think, with others was to tell a story to, to broaden their interest. Um, so I think, it's, I think it serves a, a good purpose most of the time. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, you talked a lot about um, just like in general the people, and I was just curious um, what the most insightful fact you learned from the people about the people. <laughs> you mean guests? No, just I mean observation. Observation. You mean just of the people? Collective. Yeah. Um, okay, that's a great question, and I think I have a good answer. <laughs> the Average person, meaning American, and I could move a little bit beyond the borders because you could talk to people from England and Ireland who I think have some of these same sentiments, but the average American today, white American, let's be clear, has never really thought about placing any sort of judgment or opinion on the Confederacy. And that is stunning. That's changing very quickly in recent years. But that is so exactly the opposite of how those who fought the war felt. Because I can give you thousands of examples. If you say the word, for example, treason in the context of the Civil War, you can make some people's heads explode. Like, how dare you use that word? Well, Northern soldiers used it all the time. In fact, the President of the United States said it was treason. He called them insurrectionists. He called them insurgents. Lincoln used all sorts of terms that today people would be like, well, they're just Americans. You can't say that. Why not? That's what they said. Now, I'm not saying that they're right, but that's what they said. And so I think that's been revealing too, but younger people don't fall into those dogmatic traps because I think a lot of young people are not to, someone asked the UDC question. They're not influenced by the lost cause and the UDC's narrative as much anymore. And the fact that you can see Confederate flags in rural Wisconsin shows you the problem of the Confederacy lingers. And I don't, I'm not just picking on Wisconsin. You can travel across the North and see it because it's a sign of rebellion. Dare I say, there's probably a conservative or two in the crowd. I'm conservative 
And when I saw a guy running to the Capitol on January 6th with a Confederate flag, I was appalled. Appalled because not even the Confederates got in the US Capitol during the Civil War, but that guy's running around with the flag? I was like, hmm, see, that's a problem that has to be addressed in some form or fashion. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk a little bit about Buchanan's inaction and how they contributed to the war? James Buchanan, president before Lincoln, inefficient is what I would say, <laughs> um, and beholden to slaveholders. He was a Democrat. By the way, the Democrats were the conservative faction in the country, so let's be clear on that. The Democrats of today, no matter what they are, um, are not the same as the Democrats then. But Buchanan was a Northern Democrat, so he was anti-secession. He didn't think that was the right move, but he was so locked in with, with the Southern Democrats who were pro-secession that he was immobilized. And it, it's why he was, didn't even get the nomination. He was, you know, the, even the Democrats didn't want him running. So the party split. Third party candidate comes in, Lincoln wins in a landslide. Ellie, yes? Who, who designed the new statue? It was a man who today lives in Ohio, but he's originally from Tennessee. Um, just a great guy. Um, and he was incredibly proud to be part of the process. He's from Paris, Tennessee, I believe. Yes, ma'am. So the, the um, statement that a lot of the statues that were erected were to remind people to stay in their place, uh, what percentage, roughly, not knowing exactly, but uh, do you think uh, of the statues that were erected in Confederate monuments uh, were for that purpose? I, I don't know. I can't. I, I've, I'm never... I, I certainly can't give you a percentage answer. Yeah. And, and I don't think for some people, white people, that they ever, think about this. If you ask the average person who died in 1990, who was born in, let's say, 1910, what do you think about gay people being married? They would be like, what? What are you talking about? Because they never thought about it. Even if they knew someone who was, they j it's just not even in their thought process. And so I think for a lot of people when they were putting up monuments, it was to honor people they thought should be honored or remembered, and they never thought about what the Confederacy had stood for because they looked at black people and thought, well, they're, you know, that's just, oh, they're, now they're free, but, you know, that's, they'll go work somewhere else doing the same work. It's just, I don't think they ever thought about it. Now, there were ones who did. Okay. I think the most pernicious examples of Confederate monuments, hey, we're in Nashville, so let's talk about the one that was in the Capitol. When Nathan Bedford Forrest's bust was put in the Capitol in the 1970s, that was done with intent. Now, you may, have, you may want to couch it in the idea that Forrest was a hero. Well, by 1978, you had no good reason to think that he was a hero to everyone in the state of Tennessee or that he represented Tennessee's best interests at that point. That's just my opinion. I might be wrong, but I bet I'm not. <laughs> and those later ones are way more problematic. When you had statues to Lee and Jackson that were put up in Baltimore in the 1950s, mm -mm. when you see a school in Florida that's named for it's Nathan Bedford Forest High and it was named in 1958, mm -hmm. see, you can see the, the alarm bells start to go off. I think when the veterans or the veterans' family, like their kids were involved, those are a little more dicey. And sometimes you have to read the speeches of those who gave the um, commemorative addresses. They'll be real, real revealing as well. But let's also be very clear. Uh, my earlier statement was, someone asked me once, what do you think the landscape would be like had the monuments not been put up? And I've come to believe that we'd all be better off. The Confederate monuments. Because the Confederacy is always going to be well known. It's not going away, just like the revolution. I mean, seriously, if you took a poll, how many people could name a battle in the American Revolution? Seriously. <laughs> I'm being serious. You know, someone would be like, Bunker Place, Spunk, York, Yorkville. You know, they would stumble through it. But they know what, what 
they know who was fighting for this and who was fighting for that. And you look at a Confederate monument and it's like that person's supposed to be honored and revered. The problem with Confederate monuments that I've come to learn is that they were always controversial with factions in the United States. This is a great question because it made me think of something else. When I say controversial, you think the black community, even if they were ambivalent, that they were like, yeah, let's put up one of those. I don't think so. And the great, here's a quiz, see if anybody can answer this. The greatest resistance to putting up Confederate monuments in the 1890s was who? Good guess, but not quite. Who do you think was the greatest opponent of Confederate monuments in the 1890s? No other guesses? No one wants to be brave? Like me. U.S. Army veterans. You know why? Because there were Southern politicians who thought they should have these monuments in the newly created national parks. And the U.S. veterans, the Grand Army of the Republic, the early version of what today we'd call the VFW, was like, hell no. We fought those people for four years. They can have markers for their military units. They don't get a Stonewall Jackson statue and Jefferson Davis. No, that's why you don't see them in national parks. Here's your homework. Go to all the national parks. You will find Robert E. Lee in only one national park, and that's Gettysburg. And they fought for 20 years before they finally relinquished and let him be put up in Gettysburg just because it was Gettysburg. Lee doesn't exist in any of the others. So yes, the black community was certainly opposed, but white northerners who had served and their family members were like, mm-mm, no way. That's how they ended up in so many public squares. Okay. They're like, oh, we can't get them in the national parks. We'll just start putting them in towns everywhere. And then that's over 20 years. It's just one after the other, after the other, after the other. There's over 1,500 estimated in the country. So, so in Vicksburg and in Gettysburg, the monuments that I see are generally to military, individual military units? Yes, yep, correct. Yeah, but Vicksburg's an interesting one. There's a later uh, addition in Vicksburg, because that's one of the original military parks. Vicksburg has kind of a ring. It's like Confederama. There's like 15 Confederate generals uh, around the, uh, it's like the Louisiana Redan. But they were all added like decades later. And, and they are not nearly as impressive as the Union monuments. That's right. And, and, but, you know, remember what Mississippi, its resistance post-World Civil, post -World War II. And so I think that's a move. Mississippi lobbied the federal government, and they got it done. Yes, ma'am. You know, I, I don't know. Um, I, one of the interesting things that I've learned about the push for women's right to vote is the greatest opponents, some of the greatest opponents of women's right to vote were white Southern women because they didn't want black women to vote. Talk about cutting your own throat. <laughs> that you hate someone more than you like yourself. I've never figured that out. That is the most like self-destructive kind of path. And, but think about how controversial the, the right of black men to vote was. You know, they get through the constitutional amendment in 1870, 50 years before women. Holy cow. You want to talk about social experimentation. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, the problem is, like JFK, Lincoln didn't expect to get killed. So he chose a running mate. JFK made a better choice. Um, you know, Johnson ran into a buzzsaw. If you've never been to his home place in Greenville, it's a w actually a wonderful place to visit. Because Johnson is a very, to me, an incredibly, in, in, uh, he's an important but interesting character. He's bellicose. He's He's, he drinks too much, he's very committed to the Union, and perfectly willing to see slavery ended, and that's where he wanted civil rights to end. That was it. 
And so Johnson, like a lot of other Southerners, believed that we would just go on, bring the states back in, and there'd be no slavery, and the states could make their own decision going forward. Well, Johnson, of course, was a Democrat. That was Lincoln's gravest mistake, but he chose Johnson for obvious reasons. He was the only US senator from the South who stayed loyal. He ran into the buzzsaw known as the liberal wing of the Republican Party. And they, of course, were pushing for real civil rights. And Johnson, like some other presidents, I won't name any names, um, couldn't back up. He only could move forward, and he liked the fight. And he got one. The real first bona fide civil rights president is the guy who followed him. Ulysses S. Grant is finally only in recent years getting the credit he deserves, especially in his first term, for enforcing Reconstruction rules, busting up the Ku Klux Klan, and trying to live up to the promises. But the problem for him is by his second term, he's beset with economic troubles and corruption, and then Reconstruction ends, and then you know within 10 years, you've got Jim Crow. So the, that's a long answer to say, I don't know that it could have turned out any worse, but the guy who came in cleaned up the mess reasonably well. And, um, but even Lincoln, had he lived, I don't think anyone quite knew the kind of resistance that would still go on in the South. You know, when Lincoln talked about the better angels of our nature, had Lincoln lived, I think he might have put up with it for about six or nine months and eventually said, all right, you know what? This soft hand of reconstruction isn't gonna work which is what Grant did. Because when Grant came in, he started, he really, really pushed. And it's wonderful to finally see him, you know, getting some long overdue credit. But you know that there was only after Andrew Johnson, here's a, here's a funny historical tidbit, that there was only one Democrat elected to the White House until Woodrow Wilson. Think about that, that's 50 years. Republicans literally ran the executive wing of the government for almost half a century, until Woodrow Wilson. And the only Democrat who got elected, do you know what he did for his inaugural day parade? He let Confederate veterans ride in it. And it incensed the GAR to such a point that that's what began the opposition to Confederate monuments in the parks. They were just outraged at the fact that this guy let these former rebels ride in the inaugural parade toward the Capitol. Those are things that I, I didn't learn until I was, I mean, gosh, I probably was in my 20s, 30s, that really give you a different flavor for, there was no great reconciliation. There were a lot of people who carried very deep animosities among the white population, certainly among the black population. It's why we struggled so much and for so long. Still are. And still are. So you must have some opinion on the Battle of Nashville monument that is sitting on Granny White Pike. Well, I mean, not, I mean, not really. I, my only opinion is I wish more could have been saved of Nashville because, you know, this is where it all really ends. Well, I just meant the, the motivation, I, think, I know this mix, was that that statue, which has two horses with a youth holding them together, was a symbol of unity that occurred with World War I and trying to, it's been called a peace monument, I think that's probably true. I think that was the reconciliation that a lot of white people felt had happened by then. But that omits an entire group of people in the country. World War I or Spanish American War? World, I, think World War I. I think it's World War I. Mrs. Caldwell had it put up because her son died and it was near her house. Till the that's, that's right, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, what? I said Mrs. Caldwell had it yes. put up because it was near their house until yep. the tornado took it down. Yep. James, you know, funny story about reconciliation. You know, the old soldiers would get together at some of these reunions. We've always seen the video footage, you know, these old guys shaking hands. Most veterans never went to reunions. They didn't want to look at the other side. They didn't want to see him. Didn't have any desire. And even among those who did, they'd still grapple. At the Gettysburg reunion in 1913, there were about 10,000 attendees, if my number is correct, and there were about 350 reported cases of assault. <laughs> These guys were literally busting each other in the face and breaking arms and legs. They hate, they, some of them really did hate each other. They, and I, I didn't learn that. I mean, when, I, when I read about Franklin, 
to go back to my World War II days, I think the guys who fought in the South Pacific carried something with them that a lot of other veterans never did. I saw something in their eyes and the way they talked about it that really deeply impacted them. And I think for some of the guys who had fought at places like Shiloh and Vicksburg, it wasn't just the war, it was who they fought. They didn't like the other side. They didn't like what they had done. They didn't like what they had stood for. And um, some of those feelings never went away. And it got dulled as the veterans by the teens and the 20s, you know, a lot of the old vets were dying. You know, and then we go through World War II and, or the depression of World War II, and then we get to the centennial, and then it's, you know, everything's romantic and gallant and heroism and all that. And, here we are. I think we're in a better place with our war than, than we have been in a long time. I think there's a lot of really good introspection going on about it. Because it is certainly, other than the revolution, the most redefining moment in our history. It course corrected us. Constitution is fully intact as it was before the war, except slavery was ended. And then we've had amendments since then. Bill of Rights is still there. All the states are still here. You know, there's still three layers of government, a bicameral legislature. You know, so much remained the same, but we had to stop this idea that you could just secede at will and slavery had to be ended. And we've been working on the rest ever since. So the last thing is if you hear people today say, oh, we've never been more divided. You can remind everyone that yes, we've been far more divided. We really have been. We were, some, I, many of you are old enough to remember 1968. You know, that was no peach. And I think a lot of people today have forgotten how troubled the country has been at many, many different times. And yet it has endured through ups and downs. Yes, ma'am. Well, for a fuller story, a friend and I just got back from Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, my gosh. That place. The new, the new, uh, the uh, lynching memorial? Yes, the Freedom Riders Museum, the Mothers of Gynecology Park, all this the Clotilla, yeah, which was found in Mobile Bay. Yeah, the, the, that, that memorial, I mean, I think it took until the 21st century to be able to be honest about that, to put it up, to just say this is what happened. Without saying, you know, this whole group of people were evil and awful. It's just this is what happened to these people. Please explain further, because I've been there. Tell the audience more about the memorial. Well, I mean, you visited. You, 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 you recently visited. I mean, I could tell everyone. It, this is, it commemorates the lynching victims across the United States. And there are, there are big steel I-beam bars that the counties can go through a pretty labor-intensive process to bring the, um, their memorials themselves, to bring them back to the counties in which the lynchings occurred. It's, it's stunning. I think, though, from, just for me, the way that you are introduced to it when you see people literally chained men, women, children outside. You see the look on their faces. And then you walk into this 19th and 20th century almost house of horrors that these things happened. And when you look at old, as someone like myself, when you look at old photographs, people would gather around these lynchings like it was a tennis tournament. I mean, they're drinking, they're smiling. I mean, it was good times. Burning people alive just, just because you know, and, and the fact that it's being memorialized. And I know some people are like, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to remember these awful things? It just divides us. Go to a concentration camp. There's a reason sometimes you have to look at it to understand that that should never, ever happen again. The, the, uh, the placement of those large metal things, there are two of them, one for a county to be placed in the county where the lynchings occurred and one that's in the memorial. And I contacted them about putting one in Rutherford County, Williamson County, Montgomery County, where all my ancestors were. And there's a really strange process that the county has to yep. embrace to allow the lynching memorial to come to a county square. That's true. And I think that needs to be changed. Well, I guess they'll have to make those decisions. But I mean, I've read the process. They want to make sure that if it gets moved, it is done the right way. That it ends up being put on an exhibit that people can see it. Because I think some people, quite honestly, if they got a hold of it, they just stick it in a room somewhere. Nobody could ever look at it. You don't ever want that to happen. 
Well, gosh, we've gone on for forever, hour and a half. I have to go back. I have a board meeting tonight.